we're in class number eight in our series on the Holy Spirit, which is one of at least three that we're going to do. Uh, this one we'll hopefully close tonight and uh, get into a new one, um, a new series next week of something else, something different, uh, something new in the Holy Spirit. We talk about another aspect of it, and then hopefully before the end of the year is that we'll do it again. Uh, we'll talk about a third aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So. Um, we started this uh, some weeks back, started to talk about the, the, the Trinity actually was something that we needed to take up and look at uh, so that we'd understand the position of and the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in the Godhead. And we begin to see the personality and the individuality of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Trinity and God being three persons in, in, in one Godhead each one distinct, each one individual, but uh, each one omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, all with the characteristics of Almighty God. So we took that up, talked about that. <coughs> Excuse me. I do not want to have a night of this. Anyway, we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. It was selective, it was temporary, and it was sovereign. And we just started right from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and there was the Spirit of God, busy, uh, carrying out, fulfilling, creating the Word of God. And we went right down to the book of uh, Revelation on that very first night and discovered that there he was in the very last chapter of the book of Revelation, a few verses from the end, Spirit of God making an invite to people to come. So he's been involved and always has been and will be involved in human affairs, right from Genesis 1 down to the book and the last verses of the book of Revelation. And his ministry uh, varies dependent on the, the dispensation or dependent on the time period. And sometimes his ministry can, be, uh, can, can excel. It can become more glorious. In fact, the Bible tells us, and we might get to it tonight, that... Um, in Corinthians that there was an administration or is an administration of the Spirit and sometimes that administration is more glorious than other times. Uh, but we took this up and we saw him uh, coming upon people and anointing them to do things that they couldn't ordinarily do. This is what the anointing was. The ministry of the Holy Spirit and that anointing was ordinary people in, empowered to perform supernatural tasks. Again, the prophet, the priests, the kings, the, the judges, the leaders, those that built the, the, the tabernacle, and although they had come out of slavery with no skill sets or trades, and God, by the Spirit of God, came upon them, and while he was there, and he enabled and empowered them to do things that they could not ordinarily do. Again, people like Saul, who was just a, 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 a keeper of, of, of animals, uh, he becomes the king and gets anointed to be king. David, who's a shepherd, becomes king. Um, uh, Joseph, who is taken out of prison uh, after years, uh, having been sold a slave by his brothers, becomes second in command to Pharaoh. Daniel, we see, uh, becoming the prime minister under four different dynasties of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Balshazzar, Darius, and Artaxes. Um, all of these people uh, didn't necessarily have a skill set in the natural, but the Spirit of God gave them the skill sets. They were anointed to do the jobs that they were doing. And so we took up this whole aspect of anointings. And we went through that all through the Old Testament, referring back to the busyness of the Spirit of God throughout the Old Testament. And then things changed. And they changed uh, uh, wonderfully. And we went to this verse of scripture in John chapter 1 and verse 32. Everything was, was standard. I mean, everything back then, uh, uh, the, the ministry was, uh, uh, it was temporary back then. Uh, that's why David wrote in Psalm 51, uh, uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and, uh, and renew a right spirit in me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. He was afraid that the Spirit of God would, would be taken from him because it was only temporary in the Old Testament until Jesus came along. And then we read this last week in John 1 and verse 32. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. Unlike the others where he came upon and rested there for temporarily, this was different. Jesus had the Spirit of God take his abode there. He came on him, and, and that was it. He stayed. 
It says, and it abode on him, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and I bear record that this is the Son of God. Something different happened here. The Spirit of God, that anointing that we were familiar with as we read through the Old Testament scriptures that was temporary, now it came on Jesus, but it came on him and it remained on him. It, it, it stayed with him. Unlike all the other anointings that transferred from one prophet to the next, from one priesthood to the next, from one king to the next, or as God used people when they were finished being used, that, that glory or that anointing, that ability uh, lifted. But on Jesus it stayed. It says it this way also in John, John chapter 3 and verse 34. It says, For the one whom God had sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. Jesus, unlike all of the people that preceded him in the Old Testament, when I say preceded him in the natural, natural human beings, all of them carried, that carried an anointing carried a limited. When the Spirit of God came upon different people, they were anointed to be a king, or they were anointed to be a prophet, or anointed to be a priest. But the Bible says here that the anointing that came on Jesus was without limit. He had the full spectrum, the full scope, full capability of the ministry of the Holy Spirit on his natural life. Now, I know people think, well, he was God in flesh. Absolutely. But he didn't operate as God. Uh, the first Adam was the one who made the mistake and that got us in trouble. And this last Adam, Jesus, who came in human flesh to win back what the first Adam lost. And so that's why he had to do it in human flesh. So he had to do it like a human being. He had to do it like the rest of us would, would do. And so he came and he took the same anointing and uh, he had the anointing without measure. So Jesus was the exception to the rule. All the Old Testament rule was, it was uh, temporary, it was selective, and it was sovereign. Yes, sir. Yeah. Into Adam, which you know we kind of think of as infusing Adam with quote the Holy Spirit. So I'm just curious if, if Adam and Eve pre sin nature had a different kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit that maybe we do now. Or different relationship, but I'm going to explain that to you. Today. I love the questions you ask. Okay. You always jump ahead of me, <laughs> but I, it just lets me know that you're thinking. This is this is how we think when we get to this stuff. Yes, Adam and Eve's relationship with God and the Godhead was different. Um, and this is what the, the Jesus has come to fix. Always remember that. Jesus didn't come to take us to heaven. He came to fix what Adam broke. And remember this, Adam didn't fall from heaven, so God's not restoring us to heaven. Adam fell from earth, and God's restoring them back to the position that we were on earth. As I said, I think in one of the services, one of the classes we did recently, how everything about the Word of God and, and what we have today is all re, repentance, renewal, regeneration, restoration, um, all the uh, redemption, all of the re's, and what re means to reestablish or to put back in the place that it was, to redo it, to re situate what it is. So the whole purpose of the new birth experience is, is, believe it or not, is to put us back where Adam was. It's to restore what we had because it was awesome what God did. God said what he'd done was very good. And the devil didn't ruin it. I mean, God said, I can fix this. And he did. That was the first thing he told Adam and Eve. He didn't even tell Adam. He told the devil. He said, you think you broke it, but I'll fix it. I'm going to fix it. I'll sort you out in the process of doing it. So, Jesus was the exception to the rule as far as humanity was concerned. And in order to explain that, I've got to kick back here and answer some of the questions that Mike already poised there this evening. Genesis 3.8. And 
in order for us to understand where we're going in this next series and what it was that God had come to do and, and do not just for us but to us, I've got to go back and explain what was going on. In Genesis 3.8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from what? The presence. This was one of the awesome abilities that man was given. Man had the ability to come right into the presence of God. You know, in order for something to thrive, it's got to be connected to its source. You take a rose bush and you plant it in the soil, it thrives. You take a rose bush out of the soil and put it in a jar, it'll die. It's like the flowers. We got flower for Lucy the other day. Or, and, uh, you know, when you pick them off the bush, they look beautiful. The roses are smashing. They look gorgeous. But the minute you cut them from the rose bush, although they look pretty, they're already dead. Or if not dead, you will, you will see the manifestation of the separation later. But once you sever them, they're dead. It takes a while for that death to manifest. And likewise, if you want something to thrive, you've got to connect it to its source. So Adam was thriving because of what? His source. He was connected to his source. What was that connection called? Yeah, but... No, well, it is. It's all of those things. But I'm, I'm trying to get you to... I've highlighted a word. So without getting off the chair and pointing it out to you, it was the presence, all right? It's just, it, they were there, they were connected, they were, God and, 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 and them just got together and, and, and they, they were thriving because he was there, he was with them, they were with him. Sin changed that. Man's ability to come into the presence of God. We, when we give a definition of righteousness, right standing with God, right relationship with God, we, we talk about it this way. Righteousness is the ability to come into the presence of God without the sense of inferiority or guilt or shame. That, that's what righteousness is. When you're in a right relationship with God, you come into his presence without a sense of inferiority, guilt, or shame. But when Adam sinned, the very first thing Adam did was hid. The very first thing that Adam did was try and cover himself and his nakedness because he had become aware of his unrighteousness. He now, when he came into the presence of God, had a sense of inferiority, a sense of guilt, and a sense of shame. That's what unrighteousness is. That's why when you, you have believers and they go to God and they crawl in on the bottom lip to God and say, oh God, you know, if you'll do this, oh God, if you'll do that, and oh God, you know, I don't know if I'm good enough, I don't know if I've given enough. That's sin consciousness. You're coming into God's presence with a sense of inferiority, guilt, and shame. But when you understand who you are and what you have in Christ Jesus, and that you're there not because of who you are or what you've done, but because of what Jesus done, then you come in there with a sense of, the right to be in God's presence, not because you earned it or deserve it, but because of God. And so this is righteousness, the ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority and guilt. So man was, his ability to come into the presence of God had changed, that had altered. He now was sin conscious. He, was, he, he wasn't righteous conscious. But God still wanted to be with man. That was always God's intention. And let me say this about God too, just as, a, as, a, as an off note. God's plans for man and God's love for man and all of these things that God had never changed, even through time. No matter what man has done or where man has been, God's plan for man never changes. He doesn't have to change his plans. His plans are great. His plans are good. All his intent toward man was wonderful. So, down here in the, in the book of Revelation, we see this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God. What, what, what's the tabernacle? It's where you live. You know, when, when you fill in a census form, they ask you to tell us where you, where you abide. Where's your abode? When people say, no fixed abode, that means I sort of don't have anywhere to call my home or a roof over my head. A tabernacle is where you live. 
So he says, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is where? Do you know that God, right from Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, right down to the book of Revelation, that passion for, of God has never changed. God always wanted to be where? With us. <laughs> Boy, it just, he just does. It's like Lucy wanting to go home to Ireland and see the grandchild. You know, and, you know it's wonderful that they're there, but she's always talking about being there with her. Um, and God's intent for us has always been to be with us. But now man's abilities or man's uh, uh, come to God or being in God's presence is different. It's, it's different. God hasn't changed, but man has because of sin. So God starts a process of endeavoring to set up systems where he can come and dwell with us in our sin consciousness. All right? So we, we saw, you know, all of the covenants and deliverances and the, but he eventually brings this crowd of people out of Egypt and he forms a nation from them. And here's what he does with the nation. He now creates an environment that he can and his presence can come and be where? With them. Because he wants to be with them. He said, God is the whole universe to run. God wants to be with us. God wants to be with us. That's the heart of God. And so it says here, and let them make me a sanctuary, he said, that I may dwell where? Among you. I don't want to be separate from you. I didn't create you and put you on a planet and stick you in the middle of the universe as a little blob somewhere and forget all about you. I want to be with you. I always wanted to be with you. I come down every evening and we talked and walked and we, 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 we just had this fellowship together and, and sin contaminated it and, and distorted it, but it didn't stop God wanting to be with us. Even though man's view had changed, God's hadn't. So God says, Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so you shall make. And he said, look it, just let, let's, let's get together and let me put something together where I can come down and you guys will be able to enjoy at least me in some format, some manner. My presence can dwell among you. So they created, what was it? Tabernacle. Tabernacle. So that's what they did. In Exodus 25, in verse 22, it says, And I will meet with you there, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in the commandment unto the children of Israel. He said, I want you to create a place. I want you to create a, a space where I can come and spend time with you, where I can be among you. And, and from that place, I'll meet with you there, and I'll talk to you from there. And even though they were sin conscious, even though sin had, had changed their perspective and their optic of God, God's desire to be with them never changed. And so he created this tabernacle where man could come and through sacrifice and whatever, have some form of forgiveness temporarily for the ability to be able to fellowship with God and enjoy the blessings that God had always intended for men. And so this is what he done. Now, before I get to this, that was fine. Chapter 25, and this, the, he sets up this tabernacle that how many of you know, eight chapters later, He's given him the law. He's given him all this stuff. And many of you know what happens eight chapters later? They may are doing golden calves and the whole lot. They didn't even get started. And they're all ready to mess the whole thing up. And so here's what God says to them all. It's amazing. He said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people, you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land that I promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's still good to his word. Saying, I will give it to your descendants. That's what he had promised, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, fine, off you go, Moses. Just head on. He says, and I will send an angel before you. And drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, 
Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I'm not going with you. <laughs> I mean, he was peeved at this stage. They were a stiff-necked people. And he goes on to say, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. I mean, I just have no patience for you. you you're, after all I've done, you know what? Here, look, at, I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, here's what we'll do. I'll just send an angel. He'll sort it out. Just go ahead, the whole lot of you. I'm done. I, 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 no, I just, he's just, don't know how to deal with you. I'll find someone else. And he told Moses several times, if these people don't want me, that's fine. I'll, I'll start with you, Moses. But every time Moses went back down, Moses interceded for them and go, oh, come on, Moses. And he said, okay. And he, and he gave in to Moses. But here's what he said. I'll send an angel to bring you in. I'll send an angel now. Hey, you'll have an angel looking after you. But I'm not going with you. Or I extract my presence. I'm not going. You go on yourself. And then Moses jumps in. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know who you'll send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, Moses said, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is still yours? You were the one who brought them out? Then he goes on to say, and the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses did this loads of times. And that bunch of people would have been left uh, because they had no faith. But Moses kept them in there. So God eventually says, okay, I'll go. Now Moses carries on. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses says to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? That's a powerful statement. And Moses understood it. He said, you know what? If you're not coming with us, we're not going. Why would we want to go anywhere that you're not going? If your presence isn't with us, we're staying put. And he says, and by the way, how will anybody in the world ever know that what makes us unique, what makes us special, is not because we're better looking than anybody else? I mean, if that was the case, the Irish would have been God's chosen people. But, but it wasn't down to good luck. There's no need to laugh so heartily. It's obvious the Irish would have been with the intelligence and everything that we have and the humility. Yeah. <laughs> and, the <potato> and, <laughs> and that was the British, but we won't get into that. All right. Yeah, don't get it confused now. You'll get Lucy will take you outside and she'll she'll beat you. So, you know, he, he Moses says, God, d nobody in what makes us different from all the peoples of the world. It is not our height or our, our, our skin color or our class or our geography. What makes us different? What makes us special? What makes us unique from all the peoples on the face of the earth is you're with us. Your presence is among us. Period. When you're with us, we're good to go. But without you with us, we're just another bunch of people. Your presence makes all of the difference. And, and this is the way these guys lived. That was what was so important to them. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. So he said, okay, I'll do it. I'll go with you. Because of you, Moses. Otherwise, I'd have sent an angel with the rest of them. But because of you, yes, I will. I'll go with him. And so that's exactly what he done. And so... God set off with them in the, in the tabernacle. Whatever that is, I have no idea. <laughs> anyway, so this is, what, this is what they witnessed as they went through and on their journey for the next period through the wilderness with God. 
What they saw was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The cloud by day covered them from the hot searing sun in the desert and the fire by night lit up the camp. Now the camp, there's three and a half million people living in tents. So you can imagine the spread of this thing all in their tribes. It was huge. It was many, many tens of square miles. But this pillar of fire lit the whole camp up at night. They didn't need street light. And they had light. And they didn't need central heat. And they had heat at night in the cold desert. God looked after them. And this is what they witnessed, uh, following them constantly through the desert. It says it this way. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when the tabernacle was dedicated and the, and the cloud fell on the, on the tabernacle, nobody could go near it. I mean, God's presence showed up, and that's, that's what they saw. That's how they knew God was with them. All they had to do was come out and open their tent to stretch in the morning and yawn, and there it was, pillar of cloud. Or going to bed at night last thing when they were putting their boots outside the tent and putting the cat out in the milk bottles. Who do you think they looked up? There you can see it. Miles away, there was this pillar of fire. They knew God was with them. They weren't afraid of anybody or anything. Why would you be with that shining there every day? God was with them. The presence of God was among them. So it says here, so that's what they did. Then they, they were governed by it. It went on to say, and when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle or from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in their journeys. So uh, when, the, when, the, when the cloud was there, they, they camped and they stayed camped. And the only time they ever moved was when the, when the cloud moved. When the cloud moved, they packed up, rolled up and started walking. And of course, God brought them from greener pasture to greener pasture in the desert. But he did it. From water to water in the desert, God did it. And that's the only time they moved. So it says here, when the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went out onward and all their, in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, and their journeys not till the day that it was taken up, for the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and the fire was upon it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. Okay? So God's presence is what made the difference. So, more than the law, more than circumcision, more than the Sabbath, more than food and civil decrees and standards, God's presence with them distinguished them from all other peoples. Remember that. They weren't unique people because they were circumcised. Today, you know, people say, well, you, you, the, the Jews are all circumcised. No, no, it's only an Abrahamic covenant. But what made them special was not circumcision. What made them special was God's presence. What made them special was not the Ten Commandments. It wasn't the, the, the ceremonial laws and all of that. That's not what made them special. What made them special was God's presence. God was with them. And, and this is what they saw. I mean, I, I can't but imagine. Why don't we have that now? <laughs> huh? I'd like to have a fire by night. I oh, know. I I would. I mean, can you it imagine? It's so obvious when I'm here to do something else. <laughs> can you imagine how awesome that must have been? Every, but you get used to it. You get used to God after a while. How awesome was church when you got born again and you couldn't get enough of it, and you couldn't get enough word, and you couldn't get away from it, and you couldn't get... And now it's, uh, oh, if I can fit it in, I'm busy, I have other things to do, I have more important things to do. I mean, they got used to it. They, they do, and you can do, quite easily, get used to the things of God. And, and they did from time to time. And uh, what they did was... Um, uh, God told them this also. He says... When you go over Jordan, or when you come out of the wilderness, which you were about to do, he said, and dwell in the land which the Lord your God will give you to inherit. And when he give it, you rest from all your enemies round about so that, they, that, you, that you will dwell in safety. Then you shall 
there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. In other words, right now we're moving around in this portable thing, but when you settle down in the land that you're going to, we'll, we'll change the apparatus, but I still have to have a place because I want to be there with you. So we'll sort something out. We'll, we'll have a place that I can put my name there. So that's where the Lord will be, and you can deal with me, and I'll deal with you from there. Thither shall you bring up all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, your heave offerings of your hand, and, and all your vows, your choice vows, which you vow unto the Lord. So basically he was saying, look, I'll take care of you uh, here, but even when you come into the other place, I want you to, um, I want you to build a place for me. Now, there were several different places that God built during the period of, the, of, of Israel, the time period of Israel. They had the tabernacle first, which we, we had in the wilderness. When they came out of there, um, the next thing they had was a temple that Solomon, David wanted to build it, but Solomon built it. It was majestic, phenomenal. Uh, uh, tab, our temple, that, that Solomon built it. And again, he built it after the same model with a holy place and a holy of holies. And they carried out the rituals the same, uh, uh, but it was, a, it was a temple now as opposed to a tabernacle. Uh, David, when he had the, the, the tabernacle with him, it was still under a tent until David came along. And, and then David wanted to build a temple for it. And God said, I'll, I'll get Solomon to do that. That temple was there under Solomon and was magnificent uh, and the ark was in there uh, sorry the ark yeah the ark was in there and God's presence was among them up until the invasion of the Babylonians some 1500 or I can't remember I can't remember the exact number of years I won't say it so but until uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and Nebuchadnezzar plundered Israel and took them captive. And they were spent 70 years in Babylon. Now, what happened there was the ark disappeared and the ark has never showed up since. The ark hasn't been around since. They, they, they don't know where the ark is. Uh, but it was there when Nebuchadnezzar came and, uh, and, and plundered the city. But there's no record of where the ark went, which was the presence of God. Um, and then when they came back 70 years later, Zerubbabel uh, rebuilt the temple. Um, and that temple was a lesser temple than Solomon had done. In fact, when the older men stood there, um, when the older men stood there and saw the temple, they cried when they saw it. The younger men rejoiced that they had a temple, but the older men cried because they remembered what Solomon's temple was like. And this was far crying short. Then later on, when Herod the Great became a king over Israel at that time under Roman governance, Herod, in order to win the favor with the Jewish people, he spent a lot of money uh, architecturally rebuilding uh, and making a magnificent uh, edifice there that was called the temple on the temple mount that's when jesus and the disciples walked in and they were saying wow look at the architecture in in um, in matthew 23 and 24 and they said oh, look at the architecture and he says listen believe me not one stone is going to be left upon another and there was that temple and then there's one talked about in the book of ezekiel which will be the temple in the kingdom for the thousand year reign it's still all with me i'm just giving you historical fact. Again, each one of these are again um, were built by man and the purpose of them was to bring God's presence uh, or allow God's presence to dwell among them. So he tells them when you get into that place I want you to build uh, a permanent place. Solomon did. Came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud before the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So that's the same thing that happened to Moses when he dedicated the ta little tabernacle, the tent. Same thing happened to uh, Solomon when they built the temple. Everybody with me? Now let me pause here for a minute and explain something to you. The evidence that God was with them 
the evidence that God was present was what? Which? Yeah, over what? It was actually over this box called the ark. Now, what had happened to that ark? Um, the children of Israel, they, they had a prophet called Samuel, but they weren't listening to what God was saying. And they became rebellious and started to, to listen to the, and, and be influenced by the gods around them. And um, what had happened was, um, are you able to listen to me and, and hear the song at the same time? Is, is it because that other door is open? Oh, okay. Well, I hope that. Oh, really? We're singing to the Lord. Well, glory. We're still listening. That's all right. Okay. Um, just, I know you are listening to that too, so I'm just trying to keep your attention. So, but when the Ark of the Covenant, uh, sorry, when they were disobedient to, um, when they were disobedient to the Lord, they started to lose favor with God. And they went out against the Philistines and they lost the battle. So somebody comes up with the idea, you know what, I have a, big, I have a good idea. When we go to battle tomorrow with the Philistines, it's in 1 Samuel, we'll take the ark with us. So they took the ark with them because they thought if they brought the ark, they were bringing what? The presence of the Lord onto the battlefield. And they thought, can't beat us when the Lord's presence is with us. So they traipse onto the battlefield against the Philistines with the ark. And what happens? They got badly beaten. Well, God didn't even have to punish them. God just didn't show up. No, that wasn't to them. That, it, 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 they, they, they lost the battle. They went back, told... Uh, uh, Eli the priest what had happened his two sons had been killed in the battle and then he fell backwards and broke his neck and, uh, and one, of the, one of his son's wives uh, Phineas' wife had a child uh, she was pregnant at the time and when the child was born they called the child Ichabod which means the glory has departed and so they fled the battle and they left the ark on the battlefield they took off, badly beaten. So the Philistines took it. So they took it back to their city. And they put it in front of their god called Dagon. And they came back the next morning, and where was Dagon? On his nose, and they pulled Dagon back up, and they stood him up again. And then they went out, and they came back the next morning, and where was Dagon? Lying on his nose in front of the ark. And they thought, what is going on? Then all of a sudden, the plague started on the Philistines. They started to get boils and hemorrhoids and all sorts of different things. And they were, the whole nation was totally uncomfortable, as you can imagine. And eventually they said, you know what, since we brought this box in here, we've had nothing but trouble. And so they put the box on a cart, hitch it to two oxen, and they said, we have no idea where to send it. God knows. Their God knows. And with that, they let the oxen go. So the oxen take off with the Ark of the Covenant on the back of it. And they come to a certain area, might just out, you know, not, not a million miles from Jerusalem. And they stop there. And people see it and they know what it is. So what are we going to do with it? So we don't know. So there was a house of a guy there called Abinadab. And so they put the ark in Abinadab's house. And Abinadab's son is decreed to be the caretaker of the ark. The ark stayed in Abinadab's house for how long? Well, a long while. It stayed in Abinadab's. If you, if you read over in, in um, let, let's go to 1 Samuel just for a second. This is a very interesting story. It's very important. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now, um, this is all part of the Holy Spirit, this series we're doing, so I, I, I'm bringing you to a point. I'm trying to show you something. First Samuel, chapter 6. Uh, 
go to ver- somebody read verse um, I know there's some awkward names and you can skip over them if you want uh, somebody read uh, verse 21 of chapter 6 Go ahead and read the next few verses. So the men of Kiriathir came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to guard the ark of the Lord. The ark remained in Kiriathir for a long time, 20 years in all. 20 years in all, and the house of Israel lamented over it. So, how long was the ark in Abinadab's garage? In his garage? 20 years. Now, after 20 years, Samuel the prophet, did you ever wonder why they asked for a king? Why did the children of Israel ask for a king? Because they had no presence of God with them. The presence of God hadn't been there for 20 years. Where was the presence of God? In Abinadab's house. He was blessed beyond belief. He was doing great. But the children of Israel lamented. And if you read the story in verse 3, And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods. And the problem was, they were into idol worship. So eventually they come to Samuel, and they ask Samuel for what? A king. They asked Samuel for a king because they wanted to be like all the other nations around because they hadn't got the presence of God with them, so they just thought we'd just be like everybody else. So Samuel's very sad over that, and, and he goes to God and says, God, they've rejected me, the prophet. He goes, now they didn't reject you, pal. They rejected me. But let's give them a king. And here's what's going to happen when you get a king. And so did he give them, who did he give them? Saul. Saul. How long was Saul king? Go to Acts chapter 7. Acts the 7th chapter. Sorry, Acts 13. Acts 13. And somebody read there from verse 21. Acts 13 and verse 21. How long did he rule? Now, how long was it in Abinadab's house first? How long did Saul reign? Now, Saul reigned for 40 years. Only once did Saul attempt to go for the ark. Only once when he was fighting the Philistines. And and I'm trying to think where that is. Um, That's in... First Samuel, let me go back here. First Samuel chapter 14. This is the only time Saul, in his whole reign, ever looked for the ark. Where is the ark at this stage? Benadab's house, all right. The presence of God is down the street, up on a hill, in somebody's garage. Now, they still have the temple, and they're still carrying out all of the... the, the not the temple, but they're still carrying out, they still have the tabernacle, and they're still carrying out all of the rituals and whatever. The only problem is, God's not there. there. Just typical religion. Mm -hmm. It looks great, it has all the pomp and splendor and whatever, but God's not there. But it looks like he is. So, it says here um, in verse 18, if somebody wants to read chapter 14, 1 Samuel 14 and verse... 18. Okay, that'll do. He, uh, he, he was going to send for it at that time, and then he stopped and said, We're, 
it was, there was just too much going on. So he never did look for it. All right? So that was the only time Saul ever mentioned the Ark of the Covenant. So he's, it's in Abinadab's house originally for? 20 years. Then they ask for a king, and he gives them King Saul. How long is Saul king? So how long has it now been in Abinadab's carriage? 60 years. 60 years. Now, when Saul died, David became king, but not of all of Israel, because some of them were still loyal to Saul, because Saul had been chasing David for, for decades out of his jealousy. Even though God had anointed David, not everybody agreed with that yet, because not everybody knew. So there were several of the, the Judah and different ones followed David, of course, right from the get-go, but the others didn't join him yet. And eventually they did. Eventually they all came on David's side. Eventually they all came around David. Go me to say our first Chronicles. First Chronicles. Chapter 13. Everybody still with me? First Chronicles chapter 13. And let me just... I wanted to show you something here. David is going to go look for the ark now. All right? Um, let, let me read um, First Chronicles 13. Uh, and somebody just... I don't know, I'll read the beginning of it. It says... And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. You all see that? David wants to go after, the, go back and get this thing in Abinadab's house. They know where it is. But then he goes down to verse 3. It says, somebody want to read that? Yeah, 3. So, for 40 years, they never inquired of it. And for 20 years before that, it's in Abinadab's house. So it's now 60 years. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. This all started in 1 Samuel chapter 6 and you go through all of Saul's stuff and chasing after David. David now becomes king in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Sorry. 2 Samuel chapter 2. I'll explain chapter 6 in a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 2. And read somebody verse 11. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. So David was king and a, 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 a relative of Saul was put in his place temporarily when Saul and, and Jonathan died. But it, it didn't last. And all of, the, all of these tribes eventually came around to David. David wasn't a, a ruling out of Jerusalem. He was ruling out of Hebron, was where he was. And David ruled there for about, well, it says here, seven and a half years. Okay? So we, we estimate, and most commentators estimate, that you can average about ten years between the death of Saul, the reinstitution of another king in Saul's stead, and then the, 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 the tribes not succumbing to him and all turning toward David. So he was seven and a half years in Hebron before eventually they all came together and said he was king. It took a while. But when they did, that's when in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David decides to go after the ark. And so, you know, they're bringing it out of Abinadab's house. So look what it says there. Uh, I'll, I'll read verse 1. And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with all the people that were well from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubim. They set it on the Ark of the Covenant upon a new cart. Uh, it says, and brought it out of the house of? So how long was it in Abinadab's house? About 70 years. About 70 years in total. 
And so, as you read the story, one of the guys reaches out and touches it. Now, the reason he died was because back in Numbers, I think it's Numbers 15, God made a law and said that the ark was only to be carried with two staves and certain family were to carry it. Nobody else was to touch it. Even they weren't to touch it. They had to put the sticks through the, the, the loops and carry it on their shoulders. And that's what David got wrong because when the guy put his hand on the ark, he, he was told it was a law that said you're not to touch it. And so that anointing was still there and that's why he dropped over dead. So it wasn't an empty box. God's presence was still attached to that box. And so it ended up in, in verse, uh, 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 somebody read verse 10 uh, uh, and 11 and 12. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. So, as you can see, 70 years, they didn't have the presence of God. Why do you think David danced the whole way into, when he got this thing? He was bringing the presence of God back into the city of, of, of Jerusalem. And he danced the whole way there. I mean, he took off robes. He Because he realized, my robe is nothing. My, my jewelry is nothing. My position is nothing. And he stripped down to his undergarments and danced from Obadiah's house the whole way to Jerusalem, like a fool, they said. But he didn't care. He did, did the Israelites know the entire time where the Ark of the Covenant mm -hmm. went? All the 60 songs that I'm sure that they did it. I'm sure that they did it. But again, they just never went after it. They were into idol worship and then they looked for a king and all sorts of stuff went on. It's amazing how many people go to church and miss the presence of God, but after a while they don't even know that it's not there. Well, I, I'm assuming that. I don't know that they said that either. I just don't think that the leaders, as I said, sometimes people just don't realize the, the most dangerous place in the world to be is where God was. You don't need to be where God was. You need to be where God is. I, I, Well, I, again, I don't think that they said leave him there. The ark was taken. The Philistines then got rid of it. A crowd found it. They parked it in a garage. But, you know, unless the leaders go look for it, the people, the general people aren't necessarily running around being super spiritual. The people with the anointing are supposed to be taking care of stuff. Yeah, prophet, priest, and king are, are, were the ones anointed. So the prophet and the priest should have been the ones looking for the ark. And if they knew where it was, they should have brought it in, but nobody did. And they were into idol worship and whatever. And then they wanted a king. And so nobody went seeking the ark. So I, I you know, we're surmising. But all I know is it was there for 70 years. And, and what I learned from that example is that there are so many people are quite happy to carry on doing the religious end of things. And the presence of God's not even there. They go there every week, week after week after week, and they go through the ritual, they go through the rigmarole, they sing the songs, and they go through the environments, and they walk out of there and say, hey, are, I, did my, I did my thing, and the fact of the matter is, they don't even know God's not in that move anymore. And as you go looking at moves of God through the years, you'll find that there were great moves of God. you find a lot of denominational stuff was named over moves of God. Problem is, sometimes God moves on from that and keeps on moving, and some people never move on from that, and they stay there, and God's not necessarily in that anymore. He's in something else, but they stay parked where they was because there used to be a move of God there, and they forgot, and they're now dumb to the fact that God's presence isn't there anymore. Still with me? The more they move the ark from, the less they realize what they're missing. And, and the, build that yeah, they become desensitized to the whole move of God. And, and they become religious. And, and it happens to all of us. You have to hunger and thirst for the things of God. You've got to go after it. You've got to want it. And, and people are always saying, oh, if God would do this and if God would do that. It's not that God won't. It's just people, you've got, to, you've got to want 
what, where, what God is doing and be where God is. So, I went through all that story just to try and explain just the difference of, of the ark and the presence of God. It, was, it made all the difference. In Isaiah 66, in verse 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you would build for me? I mean, God's basically saying, hey, Come on, lads. I don't need to be there. I mean, and you certainly ain't building something that I, you know, oh gosh, look what they built me, I gotta move in there. He's thinking, I, I, he goes on to say, thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, where is the house that you would build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things have my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this, Man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at the word. He's looking down and saying, hey guys, you can't build me anything that would make me want to leave where I is to go where you are. I'm not trying to be among you because you have overly impressed me with what you built. The only reason I would want to be among you is because I understand you need me to be there. That's the only reason. And in fact, there's nothing you can build me that impresses me. What does impress me is a man with a right heart. That does impress me. It says it this way over in the book of Acts. He says, But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, and what is the place of my rest? hath not my hands made all these. In other words, you can't build a place nice enough that God wants to be in. That's not why he is with us. It says it this way in Acts 17, 24. And God made the world and all the things therein, seeing that the Lord of heaven, he's the Lord of heaven there, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. If the Lord shows up somewhere, it's because the Lord wants to be there. But that's not... I what God wants to do. The only reason for the tabernacle, the only reason for the temple, the only reason for the ark was what? Something would know where he was. And so that he could have something by which they knew where he was and they could at least commune with him and him with them because they were in the flesh and he was spirit. Was tangible. Something tangible. But it wasn't God's best. Then it all changed. And the word was made flesh. And what did God do? He moved in. He moved into a human. Now he moves in. Now things change. God now possesses a human being. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up to glory. This was amazing. This was truly amazing. God now had showed up in flesh himself. He always wanted to be with us. Now he became as one of us. For purpose of because he loved us so much and he wanted to deliver us so that he could restore that fellowship that we had. Philippians 2, again, verse 5, Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of his servant, was made in the likeness of men. Being found fashioned in fashion found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You cannot get any closer to man than God Himself showing up in human form. So there's a reason that the Holy Spirit indwells us now, post resurrection not pre the resurrection is because pre resurrection our dwelling was sinful and God would not indwell sinful dwelling mm -hmm. after the resurrection that dwelling became pure because we were made righteous through Christ therefore the spirit could inhabit a, a pure vessel 
All right, you can take over the class because I'm done. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly how it goes. Here's what happened. And Jesus said, I pray the Father. And he will give you another comforter that he may, what? Abide, Abide with you, not temporarily. This is, this is a different move of God now. He's going to abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, for those reasons you just said, Mike. It couldn't receive him because they were sin conscious. They, he couldn't dwell in it. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells up to this point with you and... He shall be in you. This is different. Now that same spirit that showed up, that same glory that was on the temple, that was on the tabernacle, that pillar of fire, that pillar of cloud, all of that stuff that we read about, hear about, watch happening to the prophets, the priests, the kings, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the awesomeness, the supernatural activity of God among his people, all of that was done by the Spirit of God. All of it. That was all the Spirit of God, all of that. That was the presence of God. That presence, all of that presence, has moved where? In us. They'd be shocked in the Old Testament to believe that what they went up to every day, when they walked in, they had to have a blood sacrifice, they had to kill it, there was blood everywhere, there was priests, there was a fire, there was altars, there was a smell of burning flesh, there were blood everywhere, and they were cutting guts out, and, all. and then there was this tabernacle, and you couldn't get in, only a certain amount of people could get in, and even beyond that, within that, there was a holy of holies, and only one person could go in there once a year. If you and I were alive and went back to that time, in our current state, you and I would be able to walk right past the gates, right past the priest, right into the first Holy of Holies, grab a piece of bread, have a, have, have a little munch, walk in, slide the altar of incense to the side, open the curtains with the cherubim in, open it up, walk into the Holy of Holies, and sit up on the Ark of the Covenant. And everybody outside would be sucking the oxygen out of the, out of the planet, going, <gasps> can't believe they just done that. Surely they're fried crisp and dry. And with that, you'd walk right back out of it, walk the whole way out, and they'd say, oh my goodness, what has happened there? That's exactly what happened to us. And we, the church, have no idea why Jesus, why did Jesus go and do what he done so that we could... But, have, but, but you know what? We, 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 we minimize what... She, the price he paid for God to become flesh and do what he done, we minimize it for the working of miracles or speaking in tongues. Or God was doing healing people and prospering people and all of this stuff, the miracles that we, we're supposed to do today and do more. God was already doing that in the Old Testament, for goodness sake. He was raising the dead. He was making water out of rocks. He was bringing quail in out of nowhere. He was manna in the morning. He was taking care of people. God was doing miracles all over the Old Testament. God didn't get us born again so we would just live on miracles. God got us born again so we could start to have fellowship and be able to come into his and his with us. And now I don't have to go up to heaven, Paul said, to get God to come down. I don't have to go down to get God to come up. It says in Hebrews, in Romans chapter 10, it's in my heart and it's in my mouth. John Barry, I'll, I'll move on. Because know ye not that you are the of God and that the Spirit of God dwells where? In you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, and you, which temple you are. And I'll finish with this. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is where? It's in me. Now, I know if you turn out the lights, you're not going to see, you're not going to glow because of the pillar of fire, all right? And when you go out in the sun, you have to put sun oil on. You don't have that cloud to keep you from, you understand? But I do want you to understand that that very same Spirit, that very same Holy Spirit that did all of that in the Old Testament, 
has now moved into each one of us. And that presence of God is with us. Where you go, when you walk into the shop, what walked into the shop? I'll try that one again. When you go to Publix, God Publix. and you walk into Publix, Holy Spirit. God just walked into Publix. Yeah. I'm not joking. This, this, is not, not, this, is, this is not pretense. You have to understand what Jesus did and why he did it. God start, God's still here, but he's living out his life now. He's living out his purpose now through the church. We are the ambassadors. We are the body of we have forgotten who we are. We have just no idea what we are. We just think we're a religious entity waiting for Jesus to come back and deliver us all out of this mess. And you forget God's not trying to deliver us out of this mess. God is trying to get us to engage this mess and be an influence in the middle of it. And the church is living with an escapism mentality because all we want is out of here when the reality is God has equipped us to be effectual in here. Our problem is our optics are wrong. God lives in me. When I show up, God showed up. When you go to the hospital to visit, God showed up in the hospital. We should start believing God for things. So I pray, we pray, and we'll ask God to do something. Well, where are you going to go? Are you going to go up to get God to come down? Because he said, don't do that. He said, what are you going to do? Are going to go down and get God to come up? Don't do that either. Well, where is God? He's in my heart and he's in my mouth. Romans 10 in. Yes? I just have to tell you a story. This is so amazing when you said when you go to shop. I think it was Friday, late afternoon, I decided I'd go to the grocery store, so I went to Publix, right on the bridge, and I didn't have one mask. I pushed back on that. So I'm in there without a mask on. You can go into Publix and Kroger without mask. So I'm in there, and I'm down on the aisle, and this young woman, she, and I'll just tell you, I found out later this, she's about 40 years old. She walks over to me. She has on a mask. She comes up to me and she says, ma'am, and I thought she was probably going to say, you don't have a mask, you know. She comes up to me, it was so sweet, and she said, I just want to ask you something, do you know Jesus? And I said, yes, honey, I do, I do know Jesus. And I grabbed her shoulders and I said, praise the Lord, you know me too, obviously. And she said, yes. And we stood there a moment and she said, I've been a hairdresser. And I could not talk to people about Jesus. And she said, I knew that I wanted to do that. So I left that job. And she has some other woman's job now. I don't remember what it was. And she said, I had a severe accident with my ear. And she said, I made it through the surgery. God bless me. And, and you could tell it went completely different. She was leaning in. But she said, I, he has helped me and was there for me. And he said, she said, this is what God, the Lord told me to do. I want you to go and start telling everybody about Jesus. And she said, I sat there and contemplated it after a while and pondered it. And she said, that's exactly what I'm doing. And I said, way to go. That's what you got to do. And what's your name? Her name's Nicole. She's four years old. And I said, well, let me tell you the next thing you got to do. You got to come to Bible Optics. <laughs> Yeah. You know he's asked you to do this, and you're out there doing it. You just have no idea Absolutely. how happy I am to, to meet you and know you. And I said, if I don't see you again here in public, I'll see you on the other side of it. Absolutely. But isn't that beautiful, y'all? Yeah. Isn't that the most wonderful thing? Yeah. And it just encourages me to know that. And she encouraged and inspired me. She told me, she said, listen, I was scared to death to, to ask you, but she said, I'm glad I did. She goes, you've inspired me talking to me. And I said, well, we're both. I mean, this is such a great yeah. thing. Of course. And I hope she's able to share. And I hope she'll come. Yeah. Her name's Nicole. Good. I hope she does too. <laughs> well, okay. guys, the reality of it is, you know, you often hear people say, well, two or three agree, God is there in the midst. Now, Matthew chapter 18, Old Testament scripture. God is in the midst when you walked in. Yes. He's always Sometimes we say, well, we, you know, we, we, get the music going so we can bring in the presence of God. 
He's already here. Well, he came in when I came in. He walked into the room when I walked into the room. You don't have to keep praising to bring him down. I, he's already here. And now you might say that sounds arrogant and whatever, but it's not. It's, it's, it's being righteous conscious. It's known. Well, tell them to come to the next class because <laughs> now that we have set this up for the next class, the next series we'll do is why that happened, okay. why he moved into us. So we're going to talk about the work, the two, full work of the Holy Ghost. This next series we'll talk about the work he does to us, and then after that we'll talk about the work he does through us. They're different. But we're not going to do a series on the Holy Ghost now for a while because you've got to think about these things. Meditate on it. So I'll take up a whole new series next week. I haven't decided what we'll do, but we'll pick up a series next week and we'll start something different. And, and I just want you to meditate and think about what we've talked about and be aware that God is present. Yes. 